everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I have an amazingly long panel in more ways than one. Uh, we're going to start. We're going to be talking about commodities and the bear market we're in and where you can go to look for investments going forward. We're starting with uh, Willem Middelkoop, who is a celebrated author and also the fund manager for the Commodity Discovery Fund. Tony Manini from Asia Met Resources. The indubitable Colin Bird from Jubilee and Galileo. Chris Bailey um, from Financial Orbit. Peter Secker from Bacanora Minerals, who's doing extraordinarily well right now. <laughs> and last but not least, Chris Berry from the Disruptive Discoveries Journal. Um, why don't we kick it off with um, the fact that we're in a very bad commodity bear market. And what do we need to do to change this bear market? What's, what's going to be what it takes to get us into a different kind of market going forward? Willem? Um, yeah, um, I, we've been studying this bear market because we're, as investors, are very much affected by it. Um, and if you look at the past 40, 50 years, you see all kinds of cycles, you know. Commodity cycles are very strong up and down. And um, this downturn is very severe. It's, it's overdue in time. Uh, and I think um, we could see a strong recovery uh, maybe pretty soon, even in 2016, especially in precious metals. If you look at gold and silver, I think I, I'll do a presentation later on this afternoon. And I'll try to prove that we actually turned the corner because the gold price is still down in dollar terms, but only in dollar <coughs> terms. In all other currencies, it turned the corner. And if you look, I will show you a chart uh, of 20 different precious metals companies. None of them made a new low in the last three months, while, while gold and silver have made new lows again. Excellent. So that's, that's a very strong indicator of a, of a turn of the market. Good news. Tony? Yeah, look, I think um, one of the things we need to keep in mind with this cyclical downturn in the industry is that what's, what's different this time around is that de the demand side is actually still quite strong. And, you know, the underlying demand, if you look at imports of iron ore into China, uh, imports of, of other commodities into to countries, is actually the underlying <coughs> demand side is still strong. Previous cycles, demand has actually weakened off very considerably. What has happened here, the miners are, as they always are, are very efficient in catching up with supply. So supply has, has overshot uh, the demand side and we've seen the weakness uh, in the industry that we have. But you've seen what's happened. The, most of the companies have, have cut back new investment. They're concentrating on optimising the existing operations, cutting back, uh, etc. So, you know, we're setting up for the next cycle. So, you know, there's, there's, there's no investment. So at some point, the demand will, will, will bypass the supply that currently exists. There's uh, not a lot of new supply being brought on or likely to be brought on. Uh, and the next cycle will uptick. Exactly when that is, I'm not sure, but uh, it's not too far away. Colin? Colin. <coughs> well, we live in times of, um, I guess, lots of communication, lots of communication delivered to people who can't really handle the information is always troublesome. I think we, we talk about China, and I think there's a, probably an overemphasis, because 10% 10, 10 um, demand five or six years ago is different to 3% demand nowadays, because the platform, the, you know, the lower platform keeps moving. So I think we probably depend in too much on China and too much emphasis on China. Um, pendulums, I think the pendulum is swinging, and I think it's swung far too much in the wrong direction, but everyone in this panel, of course, is going to talk positive and want us to be very careful not to believe your own, smoke your own dope, but, um, <laughs> you know, for one, I'm convinced I can't believe it's lasted so long, um, and I, I, for one, think that, uh, you know, <clears throat> step off it a little bit and what's been the reaction, the, the, the bulletins, all the top mining companies, your Rios and, and et cetera, I don't think one, you've got a surviving chief executive officer from, from, from four or five years ago. And um, so these good guys put him the position for good reasons. And um, don't let's personalize it, but you know, you've been replaced by people who, chief executives, are probably a little bit more conservative. So what are we seeing from the chief executives of the major mining industries now? We're seeing conservatism. 
drastic budgets. Let's, let's swipe down the expiration. Let's cut costs. I don't read now from any of the major mining companies about tomorrow. Let's, you know, because let's face it, your, your balance sheet is your, your inventory of the um, commodities that you're working. So from my perspective, this pendulum has gone far too much in the wrong direction. And I think the, the majors will overcompensate. And uh, let's face it, I think when we talk about 205, 206, we was paying for 25 years of catch-up for reinvestment in the mining industry. Then we all went to sleep in 2008 and nothing's happened since. I think we're storing up real problems for mankind, I really do. So I reckon that around the corner is a, is a major, major turnaround for our sector. Chris, you're one of the few ones that's not directly in the commodities industry. From a pure financial sector point of view, how are you feeling about commodities? Yeah, I think for me, <coughs> When I look financially, we've moved from exuberance towards the sector, a perception that commodities were an extremely hot place to invest, to one where, just as we just heard, one of huge pessimism. And to me, that's fascinating. We all know markets go through these phases of pessimism, over-pessimism and over-optimism, but clearly we've now switched to one of huge pessimism. And you can see that by some of the signalling from the dividend yields you can get on some of the Tier 1 players, who still have good balance sheets, and underlying good assets. So to me, I think we're building into opportunity, but the question, as always, is can you remain solvent while markets remain irrational? And I think that's the really interesting aspect over the next couple of years. It's going to be making sure that you are keeping on accumulating, even though there's irrationality. I, I like the comment we just heard concerning the importance, um, the longer-term importance of asset plays, because clearly the world still has demand. We all know that. We all know the world is growing still in terms of its um, population, in terms of its ultimate demand. People forget that. And when you see a period of time when companies are underinvesting, when companies are going bust, when investors are not putting money into the sector, you know that the ultimate recovery is going to be sharper and faster than anyone would have thought from that sentiment low. So for me, I'm very excited. I've come into you know, the latter half of this year from a very light position in, in commodity-facing investments to one actually now where it's a substantial part of my portfolios. And I see huge opportunity. I think this is why, thinking ahead into next year, you should all be excited too. Yeah, you're right. It, it, it's a time to prepare. It's a time when downturn provides opportunity. So downturn provides <coughs> access to sophisticated and experienced labour who have been let go by the majors and who want to come and work for the juniors. It provide, provides access to <coughs> commodities that people have looked at <coughs> generally in the past but not specifically. And it provides opportunity to build a project at a discounted rate to when you are at the peak of the market. So if you had been trying to build a project three to five years ago, you were paying significantly for both materials and labour. Now you have access to cheaper labour, still educated labour, but cheaper. And you have access to materials building projects that, that have access to short-term delivery times and longer-term yields. So I think a downturn is a time to provide. As you say, you need to find, you need to find money. You need to find a way to fund that. And it'll be people like yourself who are generalist investors, not people who have been in the mining industry for a long time, who have been burnt for the last three or four years, but generalist investors who are looking for opportunity and say, we are now three to five years into a down cycle. It will turn over the next one to two years. And now is the time to get in near to the bottom of the market. So people are looking for long-term investments in long-term projects that they will fund and they will not have to spend billions of dollars on infrastructure. They can build infrastructure relatively cheaply and they're looking for commodities that will have yield over the next 30 years. Chris? One of the benefits of going last is I'm not sure how I can add to that, but uh, I'll, I'll give that a Be shot. Be contrarian. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> no, I think, again, uh, you need 20 million tons of copper every year just to stay where we are. You need X you know, pounds or ounces of a given commodity just to stay where we are. So if you think in five years the global economy is going to be smaller than it is today, then you know what, maybe 
mining and commodities aren't for you. Um, I think Tony mentioned the fact that you know there is demand out there, and one of the things that um, with a lot of the work that I do, it's interesting, is you're finding that technology, technology advances are creating new sources of demand. And one of those very interesting metals that we're focused on right now is lithium. Uh, <coughs> lithium is not shrinking. It's a very small market, relatively speaking. It's about 180,000 tons a year. Again, compare that to copper at 23 million or whatever the number is. But um, you know, the battery business is taking off. And so five or 10 years ago, lithium wasn't necessarily the opportunity that it is today. And demand, by the way, is growing at about 8 to 10% per year going forward. So, you know, now in this down cycle, despite the fact that lithium is growing, now's the time to get educated about how technology is creating <coughs> a lot of these new opportunities in the metals. Well, he's kind of jumped to my next question. But the next question I'd like to ask the panel is, things don't move in a straight line. Commodities don't all yeah, they'll all move up a little together, but some will move before others and for different reasons. And I would like the panel sort of going back from we've already had Chris's answer to tell us where they think that the first, what are going to be the first movers and potentially non-movers as well in the commodity space going forward. What do you think have the best fundamentals to, to, to buck the trend first? So I think you have to ignore the bulks. <clears throat> I think the bulks have been overproduced and, uh, and undersold. So you're right, it's speciality in the middle. <coughs> I like your uh, lithium proposal. I think lithium is the, the sexy commodity of the future. And, and it's sexy because it has a number of applications in a variety of spheres. <clears throat> so if you drove today to this conference in your hybrid, then obviously you have lithium in your battery. But you picked up your cell phone this morning to check the weather, and there's three grams of lithium in your cell phone. Your wife probably went onto her iPad today <clears throat> to check what she's doing in her diary, and that's got 30 grams of lithium. As, as the number of uses of lithium increases, then obviously demand increases. And it's a commodity that has a number of applications, energy storage, energy storage, energy storage, whether it's a battery in a cell phone, whether it's a battery in a laptop, whether it's a battery in a car, whether it's a grid storage battery that's storing megawatts of energy from a renewable energy source. The future of the world is how do you conserve <coughs> energy and allow it to be reused on a 24-hour continuous basis? And lithium provides that. So if you think of energy as being a commodity moving forwards, what are the sub-commodities that go into it? So lithium obviously is one. You have graphite on the, on the anode side that, that's a second. You have the nickel cobalt commodities that go into the cathode as well. So you're looking for the smaller sources of commodities that have maybe 180,000 tons of demand a year or maybe a million tons of demand a year. Don't look to the bulks. Don't look to the 500, 600 billion ton projects. Look to the smaller, sexier industrial commodities. Can I add something? Sorry. sorry. Uh, I think yeah. it's very important to go back to basic um, fundamentals, supply and demand. And we've done quite a bit of study in what kind of metals and commodities we can expect shortages in the next 10 years. And if you look at the supply and demand fundamentals, you can expect shortages, platinum, palladium, um, copper, nickel, zinc, gold and silver within the next 10 years. And of course, the demand for lithium is growing very fast, but I haven't seen any studies showing there's a real shortage coming on lithium. So it's very, very important for investors to look at supply demand fundamentals. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> yeah well, I'm a, I'm a great copper man. Um, and again, I don't think you can go across a, a broad portfolio and make um, statements that, um, because we're, we're living in fairly prosperous times and the world is, is really doing quite well, but copper is at its all-time low, and um, at a all-time low. And, and yet you look at um, the industry, and you look at the cost of putting in new copper mines. And you know, I've done my own investing, and uh, on the basis that the, the trend is my friend. If you look at the you know, Bloomberg's and your CNBC's, lots of debate um, on copper. 
There's no trend. They're arguing among, among themselves. And people are making um, long-term forecasts on short-term fundamentals. You know, to find a copper mine now takes four years. To actually evaluate it and finance it and put it into production takes another four to six. So that's 10 years. It's 2016. 2026 is a time when we need nearly twice as much copper as we've got now. And yet everybody's shooting down the projects. As I could say again, I'll say it yet again, the major mining companies are stopping all of the exploration programs for something what takes us 10 years to get in, you know, find and make it work. So look out for a miserable 2016 um, for copper. Look out for a fairly grotty half of 2017 and look for people biting the fingernails off in 2018. Copper, to me, is the basis of mankind. Nobody's going to go the fridge, the telephone, the cell phone, the car. And, you know, that Chinese now, you know, it's, the, it's about those who are 25 to 40. They're the spenders in China. They're going to want all of the things we're talking about, the fridges, the cars, and whatever you... So, and I, I have difficulty when you talk about a nation like China, 5% growth. That's enormous. And everybody's got the red in their hands and crying in the beer because it's not... 10, 15% like it was a few years ago. As I say, the platform's lifted and the demand for copper. And only, only the other day, the Chinese started buying copper. And the history says that when they start buying at low, two or three years later, the price doubles. So, you know, to me, if you want a, com if you want a commodity, what's really going to fly, where it's best to invest, in, invest in the longer term projects, copper's the place to be. It's one of the basic products. From a Chris, from a generalist investor point of view, when you're looking at mining and you're talking about sector rotation into mining, which you've discussed, what are you looking at first? So I think you've got two big cycles going on here. The first is the industrial cycle, the one which influences, you know, classically mining group output and pricing and everything else. But then you've got something else, and that's what I would call the monetary cycle or the risk cycle. And for me, these two are kind of working in slightly different ways. Many of you would have heard Jim Mellon speak earlier, talking about some of the reasons he likes gold and silver, because of some of his fears concerning <coughs> the monetary cycle. Um, large use of quantitative easing products, expansion of the monetary base, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that's a very compressed and very exciting opportunity going forward, where you would see gold and silver playing a role in that monetary cycle. Less compelling is the industrial cycle. We can see that the world is still stuttering, uh, despite the best efforts of governments and central banks. Um, I would concur that things like copper, from a purely fundamental short-term basis, look difficult. The same in iron ore as well. Now, this is interesting because most of the big listed mining companies, if you looked at what, what's influential on their profits and their output, it's copper, it's iron ore, and in some cases, gold and silver, clearly PGMs as well. So I think you've got an interesting point. My view would be uh, gold and silver offer the, be the best opportunity into 2016 because I believe some of that concern on the monetary cycle will raise its head just that little bit more, which will allow price expansion there. However, on a multi-year basis, what excites me is just what we've been hearing about the copper cycle. You know, Dr. Copper, as it's often called, the PhD in economics and all of that, <coughs> stuff, the insights it provides into the global economy when I look at things about the longer term supply and demand, it concerns me when we're not seeing the investment to replace the capacity that is being used up today. That concerns me and that provides the basis for real optimism there. And clearly that will then permutate its way into what I look at most, which is larger cap equities. So I think for the short term, for 16, you focus on gold and silver. I think beyond that, you look in the broader metals, but I think generally, investors will be looking from a very pessimistic perspective at this moment in time. We'll be looking much more favourably um, at the metals and mining space, and that will give general uplift. Um, you know, way, we all know the stock market moves beyond and before the fundamentals do. <coughs> and that is what you'll see in 2016. So I think it's time to be positive about the sector. Are you, are you in agreement, Tony? Yeah, look, I, 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 I'm very much um, a copper bull. Uh, and I think the tightening that Colin referred to uh, is spot on. If you look at, it's a 22 million tonne market. If it grows 3% per annum, 
it's, it's, it needs a new, one of the largest copper mines in the world every year just to keep up with uh, a growth rate of 3%. Uh, being, a, being a supply side guy for the last 30 years, I can honestly tell you to find good quality copper assets is extremely difficult. Uh, the head grades of the operating mines today is lower than half of what it was uh, over the past 20 years and that just translates into a much higher cost structure for the metal. I think um, Peter touched on you know, lithium and the new technologies, but one of the things that I think gets overlooked uh, with copper is that we've talked about the, industrialized, the industrial side of copper, which is you know, the urbanisation and, and the uh, industrial uses of copper broadly, but in new technologies, whether it's batteries, whether it's cars, whether it's solar panels, whether it's wind farms, the usage of <coughs> copper, you know, take a car, take a Tesla car today is using five times the amount of copper as a car built in the late 70s. Uh, a solar array for the same amount of power is using five times, six times the amount of copper. So you've got the, 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 the standard uh, uses of copper in, in industrialisation and urbanisation in developing countries with an overlay of take up of new technology and use and I think very constrained supply and lack of investment in it. So, you know, I'm very bullish on, on copper longer term for those reasons. Okay, we have some favourites here in terms of commodities and, and there actually is a fair bit of agreement on this panel. But realistically, if you want to invest in commodities via the mining sector, which is one of the few ways you can, ETFs in the broader commodities are very difficult, um, and futures isn't a game that everyone plays, what do you need to look at in a mining company right now? Um, so beyond which commodities you're looking into, which companies do you think, what are, what are a key factor each, shall we say, for a mining company to be able to survive this bear cycle because it doesn't matter how good, how great your asset is, you need to be able to survive the bear cycle and it's not going to turn around tomorrow. So, so which companies are the ones that you want to invest in now that you know that are going to be there tomorrow? Chris, go for it. I think that depends on <clears throat> where you where you want to invest in the, in the mining industry. Do you want to look at juniors? Do you want to look at developers? Do you want to look at the majors? Because I think they each have their own investment merits. Um, you know, I would personally say that it's obviously very tough for the juniors right now. Um, I think the key is it's less about drilling the discovery hole or the, you know, what used to get you the 10 bagger. And now it's more about sustainability and sort of a longer term rational plan to fit into some of these longer term uh, you know, demand projections out over the next few years. Um, I think one of the things that's obviously killed the majors is uh, the leverage on the balance sheets that was built up over the last few years and that you know, to vary, with varying degrees of success is being worked out right now. Uh, Barrick has done an actually a pretty interesting job, I think a pretty good job of, of trying to clean up the balance sheet, but there, there are no easy answers. So I haven't really answered your question, but I'm just sort of trying to point out how I look at different parts of the mining life cycle. All right. It's a bit of a very, it's similar, but a variation. Um, Peter has recently bucked the trend and he's one of the few um, junior developers that has managed to actually raise money and, and maintain a very good share price in this environment. What is it you think you're doing differently? <laughs> good question. I think we're doing things properly. I, I think we've worked from a base that says we want to develop a long-term project that has applications over the next 50 years. We've gone out and found a resource that is significantly large compared to other resources, and this is specific to lithium that has applications that can meet demand in Asia and Europe and North America. We put together a team of people that have experience in the industry <clears throat> that have built mines specifically in the lithium space over the last 30 years. And we've said that if you want to go out and find money, you have to do it in a manner that people can appreciate is a professional manner. So don't do things cheaply. Don't do um, 
uh, a resource by Joe Bloggs and Associates. Don't go and do a metallurgical test work program by the local lab down the road. Go to international consultants who have a reputation, who produce documentation that is credible and fundable. And then you have to find a counter-cyclical investor who doesn't believe that the world is coming to an end. And those people are few and far between. So it's really just a case of going out and meeting 100 people and finding one or two who believe in your vision for the future and who are willing to take a long-term view. I mean, we, we talked about four years to find a, a deposit, but it's four years to find a deposit and then it's two years to do the environmental study and then it's two years to do the engineering and then it's three years to build it. So your timetable to build a mine from exploration through to operations is 10 years, give or take. So you're looking for those long-term investors who are looking for a long-term strategy who aren't going to trade it today, buy it tomorrow, sell it the next day. You're looking for a person who sees a vision, believes in the team, and has a long-term strategy. I'd say if you're going out into the stands over there and asking people, um, trying to work out whether they've got credible plans or not, you've got to look at the balance sheet. Absolutely critical. You know, it's not about the hopes, you know, it's important where these companies are going on a multi-year basis, but you're investing in it today. And today is, it's a bear market, it's an ultra-pessimistic market. You've got to ask them what their balance sheet is like today and how much time they therefore have. The second aspect is quality. You want to buy quality. And the good news about a bear market, there's many bad bits of news, unfortunately, about a bear market, the good bit of news is that quality starts to come cheaper just because everything gets discriminately sold off. So you focus on quality, you focus on management credibility, totally agree about putting in place good people. It's all about, you know, this is where you guys can actually make a huge difference. Because what you don't realise is by going and interviewing those people out the back there, representing different companies, you're getting that critical bit of information. You're getting that feel as to whether you trust them, whether they're answering your question straight. You know, when you get answers to things about the sustainability of their project, how much cash they've got on the balance sheet, whether it's a tier one asset or not, then you can judge them. And that's, you know, in, in a way, the great thing about a bear market. If everybody comes down, you can pick through the mess and try and work out what's good or what's not. So I'd definitely say quality, quality and balance sheet are the key. If you do that, then that, that works. I, I'm afraid I have to disagree with you, and we have to keep in mind that this is a retail audience, I think. Uh, how many people work in the city as a professional investor? One, that's great, two, three, four. Uh, but for retail investors, it's very, very hard to choose the best companies out of the 2,000 junior mining companies listed in North America. And um, we follow hundreds of these companies uh, almost <laughs> within our company. And there are so many horrible companies out there. There are so many stock promoters out there. So you can't ask a retail investor to go out and ask the, the right questions because you, um, you get nailed. <laughs> and I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that for a general retail investor, it's much better to play this through ETFs. And there's so many ETFs around now to look, go long and short, and companies don't like the story because they all want you to buy their shares, but buy, trade, commodities through him through ETFs is much safer. I, I totally disagree. <laughs> totally disagree with that. <laughs> I, I I, well. There is, you guys we do agree, not know we, we the power you, got, you have. Honestly, it's not just your money investing in these companies. That gives you huge power as a non-shareholder, potentially a prospective shareholder or an actual shareholder. And I'm sorry, I totally disagree. That, that so is, we agree with this. Makes it fun. Rude. <laughs> unbelievably rude for everyone here. You guys are so you guys are unbelievably smart. You don't know how smart you are. You can ask questions <laughs> and you can decide. If you don't like it, don't invest. If it isn't credible, don't invest. Regulatory news information distribution today is so much better than it was 10 or 20 years ago. So much better. Did, uh, did all the, uh, the uh, institutional investors in Glencore covered themselves in glory? African Minerals, it went down. The institutional investors covered themselves in glory. The city will always tell you that institutions know best. If you've been here for the previous presentation, you'd have heard Sam Antar say how he built a 500 million fraud. 
And one of the best things was that 80% of his investors were institutional, because they were easier to fool than uh, retail investors. Yeah. Uh, the city always wants you to use uh, 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 collective schemes, because they make their 2% on it. Well, <laughs> Carl, Colin. Well, you know, if I may, he was suggesting ETFs, which totally follow the market. Um, there's not a lot of choice in an ETF. But Colin wanted to jump in there. Yeah, I do jump in on that one. ETFs have really you know, ruined my life, and I think a lot of people around this room. The, the gearing on them is very, is very low. I remember the good old days when, you know, if you're a gold company or a platinum company, and we liked the metal, we liked gold, we liked platinum, we liked copper, you went, your optionality was on a junior who was looking for that metal. We've lost that optionality. The safe route is the ETF, but you'll never, ever get the spectacular wins in an ETF that you can buy being, and, and generally we've got a retail audience here. They do their own work, um, and you, the question is what you want in a, in a, in a company that, you know, to, to deliver what you want as a shareholder. I, I say track record, success, breed success, balance management team, I think is extremely important. I'm not really worried about the balance sheet because I've seen quite a few companies over the last couple of years when times have been bad, but break balance sheet all of a sudden come to the forefront because they're good at what they're doing. So I think it's, it's about people, place, is very, it's still as important as it ever was. You need a team who are balanced and can work together. You need projects in parts of the world where there's sensible um, le legal codes and ownership codes. And um, I'm, I'm actually at the point, and I, I guess as I say, we're all pretty bullish in this room, certainly on this, this panel, not too many bears about, but, you're almost, if you apply the criteria of a good management team, being around for four or five years, had success before, got a good project, you can almost take a scattergun against that, against that uh, profile. And in my view, in three, three years' time, you'll have a portfolio which will perform extremely well. Within that portfolio, you'll have a, you'll have a couple of bad ones, but you'll have two or three um, which bounce along or move with the uh, with improved times for the sector and you'll have certainly two or three winners in my opinion so to me it's about done it before strong balanced teams with good asset, good assets in good jurisdictions and then you've got to believe in what we're talking about around here now i think that's um that's well, we are view. running a little bit short on time, but we've got about five minutes. Um, given that we're talking about the retail investors who want to know, do any of you have any questions for the panel? Down there. Yeah, could I ask, isn't it, doesn't it make sense at this stage of the cycle uh, just to avoid explorers completely and only invest in companies with near-term production or an actual production? Um, it's a good point, but when you choose uh, explorers who have who work on real uh, great discoveries, there are very few. But Next Gen um, has a wonderful uranium discovery in in Canada, and, and the, these these are the first to react to the upside, and they, they they can be explosive. But but again, you have to be almost a professional investors to 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 know where to where which ones to buy. So in general, I agree. <laughs> yeah, if I can just make a comment there too, and thanks, Willem. <laughs> Next Gen is one of one of uh, the companies that I've been involved in incubating. So. Wonderful, thing. thank you. Um, I think if you just look uh, uh, in answer to Tom's question, if you look across the spectrum, um, it really depends on what you're looking for. So. If you look at the companies that are in production now or near-term production, uh, on a specific example that I'm talking about is in copper, they're, they're actually still pretty reasonably well-valued. If you're looking for maximum leverage, um, back down the end where at the explorers, the study stage and the development stage, that's the, that's the segment of the market that's been extremely beaten up. So. You know, there's many, many multiples just from where they currently are to back to probably what's uh, a normal position in a normal market. Uh, and then there's a leverage beyond that by taking it uh, through the development curve and into production. But I'm, you know, very supportive of, you know, everything Colin said, it, it, it comes down to people and track record. And a fund manager in uh, in Australia who was extremely successful in junior <coughs> companies going back 20 years ago, I, I asked him, I said, 
Louis, how come you seem to be in all the small companies which have been uh, very successful over the last 10 to 15 years? I said, who's your analyst? You must have some good people working for you. He says, don't have any analysts, Tony. He said, I just pick the best people. The best people ultimately end up with the best assets. And it's very simple. That's true. So I think if there's a takeaway, um, that's, that's it. And Colin you know, touched on all the key points around that. Uh, it's a critical part. Mining's a very difficult business. Building mines a very difficult business. Uh, and there's some people that have done it continuously over a long period of time successfully. Uh, look for those people, look at the end of the, at which part of the curve you're comfortable with, but understand that there's huge leverage uh, to follow those people uh, in, a, in a down cycle like we are now. Yep, short term, have we finished? I was just going to say that um, short term safety, Tom, in my opinion, says yes, it's nice to have some earnings, but, you know, it's very doubtful that the retail investor will be able to access those earnings by way of dividend and it's very unlikely that um, you'll have the share value growth that the retail investor, who's generally risk averse, wants. So I still think the returns of exploration, the massive discovery, the exponential um, progression of a company who makes a major discovery is still important to the, to, the, to the individual we've got in this audience and probably the people on this panel. So hopefully things will turn around and um, um, people will be investing taking the risk of exploration. Tom, I know it's a massive risk, but also I've been some of the rewards which have been seen in this city over the last 20 years. Because by Jove, you know, if you hit the big one, the, the returns to shareholders are immense, absolutely immense. And quite frankly, a little, uh, a little mining company producing 10,000 ounces a year is fine. But as I say, I don't think the, the small shareholder, the retail shareholder is gonna access the earnings by way of, by way of a divvy. So, I'm looking forward to the days where, where the explorers get their, get their chance again. But I take your point, Tom, that um, to put money into an explorer in this day and age, um, we explorers are really competing for money and it's, it needs a big act of faith for the retail investor to, to, to back a, an explorer. But I hope they will and I hope the days come soon when they will do it with gusto. I'd say 95% of your money, risk reward, you've got such great opportunities in mining, should be in... Um, production companies, absolutely very clear to me. 5% in exploration as you play money, because as we discussed, as time rolls on and lack of capex into the industry, the explorers, there's a huge call option there over time. But you've got such low hanging fruit in today's low sentiment mining market, don't take the risks. 95% of your money into producers with all these filters we've been talking about, cash flow balance sheet, quality assets, good management and related. All right, I'm going to have to tie it up because we're running a little over time. Willem is speaking, um, I read his book, it's excellent, on gold, and I think you will all really enjoy it, on the main stage coming up. And Chris is speaking on disruptive technology, so energy technologies and the commodities that go into them in the gold room. Um, in a, I'm not sure what time, but I'm sure it's in your schedules. It's later this afternoon. At is Bacanora if you want to know about the, the project they're developing in Mexico. So thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, and feel free to track down the people on the panel later if you have specific questions. Thank you. Thank you.